All right, a couple things before we get into this, gang. Uh, one, sorry this took so long. I got really sick. I had the flu and a bunch of other things. Uh, two, as always, uh, check out the Discord. And three, go get some uh, popcorn and soda or something, because just looking at what I have written down, this is going to be the longest video I've ever done. And I halfway apologize for this, but at the same time, I didn't want to leave any stone unturned. Command & Conquer was the, one of the first RTS games. One of the most important in the formation of the RTS genre was its deep rivalry with Blizzard's RTS games, and one of the longest lived. So what went wrong? Between nearly 20 years and four different development houses, Command & Conquer went from one of the RTS games to the RTS game we sometimes remember when we're going through some of our older games in our catalog. Is any one person or entity to blame for this? And is there anything left in the future as spiritual successors come and go? Well, let's take a long look and try to find some answers to these questions. As usual for these videos, the best place to start is at the very beginning, which will be the early 90s. Intro, Westwood Studios a game development house in Las Vegas that had been doing pretty good for itself in the early 90s. They had put out Dune and Dune 2, which helped found the genre of real-time strategy games, and they were recently bought out by Virgin Games, which in the early 90s at least was a good thing. Things were heating up in the genre of real-time strategy, though, as a company called Silicon and Synapse had renamed itself to Blizzard Entertainment and put out Warcraft, Orcs and Humans. Westwood officially had competition. But they weren't too worried, because come 1995, Command & Conquer came out, and pretty much blew the lid off everything that even they themselves had been establishing in the RTS genre. Where Warcraft had very limited unit control, you pretty much had an indefinite number of units you can be controlling at once and use to uh, level pretty much anything on the map where Warcraft had these two dudes, depending on what faction you were playing, awkwardly moving around the s I think that's their mouth. There were full motion video movies that were still fashionable in the 90s in Command and & Conquer, and oh my god, they are just... Ugh, they are something else. While they're all campy and don't really make sense at times, and the Kukin brothers themselves in a Reddit AMA admitted that it was only a couple steps removed from shooting in your mom's basement, their words. There's just something so magical about these, and when the other guy maybe has two or three frames in their entire intro movies for missions, you're a few miles ahead no matter how bad your motion acting is. What Command & Conquer really had going for it, though, was the amazing soundtrack. Like, everybody else was doing chip tunes, and Command & Conquer just rolls up with a soundtrack that I still listen to this day. Now, as far as the plot in the beginning of the Command & Conquer continuity, which is so important, goes, Basically, a crazy meteor fell out of the sky and started turning stuff into this magical crystal called Tiberium. And what was originally a weird little cult somehow managed to own the grand majority of this stuff. And now they're a world superpower. In retaliation, the United Nations authorizes the GDI, or Global Defense Initiative, and it's basically World War III. Welcome to the Tiberian Dawn. We've got crystals growing out of the ground and obelisks with huge lasers in them. Command & Conquer was followed up the next year with a map pack called Covert Ops that was pretty much just that, a map pack. It was nice to have a few extra little CG cinematics and a bit more uh, mission to play since uh, online multiplayer was in its baby steps back then and easier thought about than done. Not to be outdone by Blizzard Entertainment, which had just put out Warcraft 2, featuring much better sprites than the previous game, and some really tight controls, especially for that era. Command & Conquer, later that year, decided to put out Red Alert, which, although originally intended as just a asset swap for the original Command & Conquer game, became wildly successful. The game boots with some scientist dudes discovering time travel and deciding that the best thing to do with their newfound abilities would be to go and potentially cause a massive shift in the time stream by eliminating Hitler while he was in the Nazi party and still coming up. No good comes from this. It then switches to an awesome intro scene with one of the 
best examples of video game music I have ever listened to. And now we're Soviets. Soviets that never had to deal with Nazi Germany and had no real uh, speed bumps on the way to a global superpower. We're also in an alternate World War II. You're just sitting there. Stalin and two people are just talking about uh, chemical weapons and stuff that I don't know if the Geneva Convention exists or not to ban. But uh, yeah, we're gassing random civilians. And then he turns to you and said, hey, I liked your resume. Uh, how about you go massacre all these innocent civilians? And yep, welcome to Red Alert. By the way, Kane is still here. I just can't get over how ridiculous this all is, but still it's like, oh, whatever. If that's your excuse for an RTS game, we're gonna do it. The game immediately starts out giving you air units and some much more improved sprites, especially in the early 90s. Command & Conquer had their sprite game on lock, it was great. And playing through the campaign for the Soviets, there's really no reason to complain. Back then, pretty much everyone was doing what were basically total conversion mods this day. Look at XCOM 2 Terror from the Deep. And the only real detractor I can think about for this game is, while the intro music is great, the rest of the soundtrack is kinda eh, especially when you're putting that awesome music from the intro in the gameplay. And especially with some margin boots and stuff, it doesn't work on loop. Other than that though, this was a wild success and I really, I am glad this exists and decided to make this. A lot of the units and abilities are pretty similar because this is still just a uh, reskin Command and & Conquer. And the expansion to Red Alert pretty much is just a map pack with a few new units. In the meantime, there was another game that Westwood released called Command & Conquer Soul Survivor, which I couldn't even get to run on any sort of uh, computer settings I had, but I'll link a few uh, gameplay videos in the description. You could arguably say that Soul Survivor was a progenitor to the MOBA genre, but the technology just wasn't there for that kind of thing yet. This game goes largely unacknowledged, and out of all the Command & Conquer collections, this one is almost never included, and for the most part, not even Abandonware sites will usually carry this. Now, I hate to bounce back to Blizzard again, especially in a video that's supposed to be about Command & Conquer, but in 1998, Blizzard dropped the nuke, and Westwood had no detector units to snuff them out. Blizzard was originally making a game that was mostly made fun of as being called Warcraft in Space, and they turned this game around, and on March 31st, 1998, StarCraft took the world by storm. You know this game was a big deal back then, because if you go to the Wikipedia page, it's not reception, it's reception and effect on popular culture. StarCraft rewrote the entire book on real-time strategy with multiple classes that are different but balanced, really good sprites, awesome music, Command & Conquer no longer had a monopoly on sweet tunes, and EA Games took one look at the wild success of StarCraft, which is to this day still in the top 10 best-selling PC games of all time, and out of the top 10 is the oldest of them all by two years. And EA decided, we want a StarCraft. We're going to buy a company that makes games like StarCraft. And then, in August 1998, EA bought Westwood. Being under the wing of the not at the time evil EA games had its benefits though. They had all the resources they need to make the next Command & Conquer game as good as it can be and an answer to StarCraft. And in 1999, we got Command & Conquer Tiberian Sun. Tiberian Sun didn't really stray too far from the original formula of Command & Conquer, featuring awesome music and the similar format for how you control and create units, but there's a lot of improvements. For instance, now you can finally queue your units instead of clicking and clicking and clicking to build up your army, which is really nice. Also, in response to the notably faster game speed that StarCraft had at the time, you can play this game at bonkers fast speed, like borderline impossible to keep up with speeds. The units and other buildings are a lot more futuristic now, and there's a lot more stuff you can do with them, and even more advanced stealth systems, which is really nice, and it adds a new dynamic to the game instead of just having two slightly similar factions. And as for the FMV, it's still there, and now with an EA-sized budget, ooh boy. 
Like, look at this. Like, you go and you're in a non controlled area and you just turn on the TV. Oh, yeah, we're murdering a guy today. Uh, I hope you're happy. And the whole thing is just wacky goodness. It's, uh, apparently in the last game you played as James Earl Jones and... You have a computer on Nod that is made out of alien technology in the brains of randos. It's great. It's kind of obvious too that they're using the same set, they're just redressing it for each faction since the people in the cinematics sit in virtually identical positions and there's really not much different. But the story is still there I guess. Apparently now Tiberium is kind of a problem, things have gotten out of hand, Kane's back, and, uh, by the way, alien tech, check out this sweet new MacGuffin we got called the Tacitus. This totally isn't going to be recycled. Depending on which faction's story you decide to play as you follow either some guy named McNeil or Anton Slavic, the guy you were supposedly playing as in the previous game and the leader of the Black Hand, and, uh, you either turn everything into, uh, a huge mess or narrowly prevent it. But we throw that out anyway because Firestorm happened. Command and Conquer Tiberian Sun Firestorm is the first full-blown expansion for a Command and Conquer game. There have been the previous map packs that have a little bit of additional content, but Firestorm was the first fully executable, this is a complete conversion, you boot this instead of the main game. And there's a lot of new stuff in it. In fact, uh, by the way, uh, making the computer out of rando brains and alien tech wasn't such a good idea. And now we've got to uh, band together, blah, blah, blah. And of all the games that have sprites, these sprites are my favorite. They have this great futuristic look to them. It really looks like Tiberium is starting to become a serious problem in this world, especially with all the mutants about the place. And there's just something about that Hand of Nod. I really wish that they had stuck with this design for the Hand of Nod than the one they eventually went with. With unofficial fan patches, you can even play this game in 1080p nowadays, but uh, buyer beware because of how games worked back then. You just see a lot more and the sprites get really small. And all the cinematics were recorded in like, I think, 240p. And they're just going to be this little box on the middle of your screen. So uh, you might not want to do that at that resolution or anything higher than maybe 720. Not even a year after Command & Conquer Firestorm came out, we got Red Alert 2. Which seems to be more of the same where Red Alert was basically just a conversion for the existing game. This is peak 2D Command & Conquer. As much as I like the sprites from Tiberian Sun the most personally, everything just looks that much better in Red Alert 2. I really wish I could show you this stuff. For some reason, out of all the games I was able to boot, Red Alert 2 just absolutely refused to record, so as you can see here, I've got cat video and some nice MS Paint drawings to illustrate the point. Red Alert 2 sort of follows the plot of Red Alert 1, except it's kind of hard to do anything in those sort of games where you've got time travel involved because everything's screwed. The President of the United States gets a phone call from the Soviet Premier and apparently we're invading everything. We've got this dude named Yuri that he can take over your brain over the phone and we have giant friggin' blimps with giant friggin' bombs. Go wild. There's a lot of just general quality of life improvements in this game. You have a hot bar now at the bottom where you can easily manage a large number of soldiers without having to click on each one for ability. And the game just feels a lot smoother. Commando units seem to be taking more of a front and center uh, point in this game. But overall, it's still a solid RTS and I'm really ashamed that I have to keep this as brief as it is thanks to just not being able to get any footage of it. The following year saw Command & Conquer Red Alert 2's expansion, Yuri's Revenge which follows the plot of that guy that can take over your brain over the phone, thinks that he can run the world better with his psychic powers, so that's what he's gonna do. So the gang has to mess around his time travel and team up in order to stop that. You know, I used to give Blizzard a lot of crap for recycling RTS plotlines a lot, but it seems to be an industry norm in the genre. After Yuri's Revenge, things kinda got wonky for the Command & Conquer franchise. While Westwood Studios wasn't exactly a single genre company, and they made a lot of different games outside of the Command & Conquer franchise, heck, they were even making Doom games as recently as 1998, it was apparent that EA was putting the screws on them to make games in other popular genres since they couldn't seem to replicate StarCraft's success. 
And that's probably why we got 2002's Command & Conquer Renegade, which is a twitchy first-person shooter that lets you take over various vehicles and pretty much ruin the Brotherhood of Knots day wherever you go. Renegade is pretty well put together, and it's delightfully cliché, and I kind of found it cute that in some of the missions you can see the overview on the battle terminal is basically a Command & Conquer game, but you're now playing as a commando. The game has a great sense of humor at times, and I really found a lot of this game to be just pristine, just so enjoyable. There is something magical about strolling into the Hand of Nod, murdering everyone inside of it, and then burning the place down. Which, speaking of which, a lot of the buildings in this game are a lot more detailed than I expected them to be with just how much stuff is going on. And there's something magical about walking down a street and then finding out you get to drive the mammoth tank now. Yes, that mammoth tank belongs to you. It blows things up good. Have fun. Unfortunately though, it's very apparent that this game was not its own original idea, but a lot of other ideas from other companies put together. If we look at the historical context of the late 90s, having a lot of twitchy shooters come to vogue, and on top of that more recently in 2000, games like System Shock 2 and Deus Ex taking the world by storm, you can tell a lot of the elements of Renegade are derivative. It's not a bad game, just unfortunately you can tell they weren't making this for the sake of having a new bold move into a new genre for the company. Renegade was the last Command & Conquer game that Westwood Studios put out themselves, as in 2003, EA restructured the company and dissolved most of it into EA Los Angeles. Two games for the Command & Conquer franchise were cancelled because of this, and then a third game was sort of scrapped, but eventually they brought back a lot of the elements in a later development. The first of these cancelled games was Command & Conquer Renegade 2. This game originally was supposed to be a way to wrap the Red Alert timeline into the Tiberium timeline, but later on in the story development, they decided that this was going to be a prequel to Red Alert 2. It never saw the light of day though, so we really don't know too much about it or what it can do. The second cancelled game was called Command & Conquer Continuum. There's really not much available about this game, and as far as you can tell, it's just got the press blurb that it was going to be an instance MMO type game, probably trying to replicate the success of titles like EverQuest at the time. Mind you that World of Warcraft did not exist at the current moment. And that's about it. You just sort of had this one teaser of a robotic thing walking around. It was supposed to take place in the Tiberium universe and the screen may or may not have been a part of the game, but we'll never know. The third title that got sort of canceled, but was later revived about five years later was Command & Conquer 3, Tiberian Incursion. This was going to be the first full 3D Command & Conquer RTS game, and it looked really promising, and they had a lot of elements of the game down. The UI looked mostly done, they seemed to have an idea of where they were going with the plot, and overall, it looked like there wasn't much reason for this game to get scrapped, aside from the massive restructuring that threw everything into chaos. Looking at what was made of Command & Conquer 3 Tiberium Incursion, it's really obvious that Command & Conquer 3 Tiberium Wars, the game we actually got, relies heavily on a lot of the ideas and concepts they made for Tiberium Incursion. The theme of Tiberium going from neat to problematic to, okay, this is a serious issue and we should focus on this rather than fighting on each other is there. And again, we see the screen, but in a much different sort of form, I call it, than what we got in Command & Conquer 3 2007. Now, all this aside, it should be said that in a Reddit AMA, Joe Bostic said that Command & Conquer 3 Tiberium Incursion was at the green light phase of development. And while everything was scrapped, according to him, in the process of restructuring the companies, maybe this is a factor of, as far as the Tiberium universe went, this was how things were going to go. You can see this in Kane's Wrath, where supposedly there was supposed to be Cabal's own faction in Command & Conquer 3, but instead we got The Awakened. If you look at these cancelled games, it's pretty ridiculous how much EA was asking of Westwood Studios. They wanted them to make three emerging genre games that each would have required a whole lot of effort, and while Westwood was a big studio, it's kind of silly to have them take steps into the MMO genre, and the first-person shooter genre, and still stay inside of the real-time strategy genre, but moving to a 3D plane. 
What was EA expecting from this? Of course they're all going to become mediocre products that need to get cancelled. A lot of stuff got lost in this big restructuring by EA, including a good number of the devs from Westwood who decided, you know what, hell no, we won't go, and stayed in Las Vegas to make Petroglyph Studios, who immediately got a deal with LucasArts, so we're going to get to that in just a bit. But in the meantime, we're going to talk about the dumpster fire that is Command & Conquer Generals. Ugh. 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 This game, I just feel like going into 3D this early was a blunder and taken with the context that they had so much done with Command & Conquer Tiberium Incursion. What the heck happened? This game just reeks of corner cutting. Some of the uh, actions in the game, like certain collector units going to get supplies, don't even have animations. And zooming in close on some of these units, which I really do not suggest you do, it almost looks like they're missing textures, which I double and triple checked my game's files, everything is intact, so what the heck is going on here? Command & Conquer Generals touted itself as a much more realistic addition to the Command & Conquer franchise and creating a third universe for Command & Conquer, but I'm just not seeing it. A lot of the uh, story campaign either seems like overtly... I'm just gonna call these accents tasteless. And the US campaign, as far as I got before I threw my hands up and couldn't take any more of it, pretty much plays out like Dick Cheney's weird fantasies in the early turn of the century. You've got the United States and China fighting this nebulous terrorist enemy that stands for I don't know what, nor do I care, I didn't even bother to play Zero Hour. I know it pretty much goes to, okay, everybody has lasers and more fantastical stuff now, we're sorry about this, but I just can't see why people would like this game aside from nostalgia and it being the first 3D Command & Conquer game, especially when this game came out a full year after Warcraft 3 base model came out, and in pretty much every way, Warcraft 3 is objectively better. The models look better, the units don't control like they're brain dead, and while yes, the upkeep system is annoying and very obviously designed to keep the number of units down because nobody was quite sure how to optimize polygons yet, at least they look good and play well compared to what we've got here. I also don't like the one-time transfer to builder units in this game that we never saw again. It was nice though that we saw a few things that we'd later get in future games like the ability system. So at this point, Blizzard Entertainment is running circles around what is now EALA and Command & Conquer was Frozen Throne. And fast forward a couple years and Petroglyph, those guys that left, are going gangbusters. They released a game in 2006 called Star Wars Empire at War, and it was pristine. I still have my original copy of this game, and I think over the course of the, like, 12 or so years this game's been out, I bought it three times on various platforms. Empire at War was obviously a Star Wars-themed RTS that had grand strategy elements, space fighting, and land fighting, and tons of different things. You could build your economy, it was dynamic, you could steal from people, you could assassinate hero units. You could pretty much play it however you wanted to play it. I even did entire playthroughs where I intentionally never attacked on the ground. You could get away with just having space dominance and winning that way. The game also had an excellent galactic conquest mode where you can take over the whole galaxy and not have any real story scenarios. The models looked great, well, at the time anyway. The factions played uniquely, and there was a way to play each one, including the third one that would come out later in Forces of Corruption, and this game was very easy to mod. In fact, people are still modding it today. There are modern-day full conversions that make this game look like a modern title. Heck, there's even conversions that put this game in the Old Republic era, in the Galactic Civil War era, which by, I mean, Republic vs. Sis. And I think somebody's working on a, uh, I guess, what are we calling these, a sequel trilogy era mod? So there's still a ton of stuff to play in this game. And compared to Command & Conquer Generals, this is just kind of embarrassing. EA and Command & Conquer would eventually get some redemption though. If you remember around the time of 2007 to 2009, EA decided that it really needed an image boost and let its development houses make pretty much whatever they wanted as long as it was a quality product. This is an era that had us get games like Dead Space and Mirror's Edge, and also Command & Conquer 3 Tiberium Wars, which as far as I am concerned is peak Command & Conquer. 
This was a modernized 3D game that ran well, even though for some reason we're still defaulting at 800 by 600. The units were cool, and the story was great. Now it goes that Kane is somehow still alive, despite the fact that it's been close to 100 years now, and you started World War III because you blew up the Philadelphia. Now everyone is acting in reaction to the new Nod invasion. Eventually, you fight Nod back to uh, the Balkans or wherever this takes place. And, oops, we blew up half the planet and caused an alien invasion to happen. You eventually can play as a screen too. Well, you just have to get through both campaigns of GDI and Nod. And one of the issues this game has is really crazy difficulty spikes at unpredictable times. Especially some of the earlier missions, like the Washington DC mission for Nod, I found out you can't beat that one unless you cheese. And there are also a few other missions on GDI, like Croatia, for example, I think it was Croatia, where there's no point in doing the game as the objectives say, and you're better off to just build up your base, smash the Nod forces one by one, and then go do the objectives. A lot of the time, I also found myself, rather than using the units this campaign wanted me to use, I just rush infantry or APCs, depending on what faction I was playing, and I'd always win. The GDI story wraps up with Lando Calrissian offering you a very extreme ethical dilemma because good ending and bad endings were in vogue around this time. And it turns out in the Nod campaign, well, apparently this was all according to Kane's plan. And then when you finally get to the Screen campaign, it turns out a lot of the stuff Kane has been saying about himself might be true, as the Screen have a file on him, even though this is supposedly the first encounter they've had. The following year, in 2008, Command & Conquer 3 was followed up with Kane's Wrath, which added a whole lot more depth to the game. There's only one campaign, though, where it turns out everything did go exactly to Kane's plan, and we scrapped the computer and made a new one that isn't powered by the brains of randos. Kane's Wrath introduces two new sub-factions for each faction that play a bit different and have different units, which is a really nice way of adding new factions without making it something that the player has to entirely relearn. And there's enough difference to where playing the Black Hand against, say, Vanilla Nod is going to be an interesting match. And so on. You've got the GDI now featuring Steel Talons and Zocom, and the Skrin have Reaper 17 and Traveler 59. Then comes my personal favorite thing about Kane's Wrath, Super Units. You get giant the size of Conyard units that you can garrison, like, infantry units inside of that will pretty much level bases by themselves. There's just something magical about having a gigantic three-barrel tank with two engineers inside it constantly repairing the thing and a bunch of missile crews alongside it so that nothing can get even close to this bad boy. Or a giant robot with a super bassy voice and flamethrowers on the shoulders! The screen one was kinda eh. Kane's Wrath also featured a global conquest mode where each faction had its own objectives on how to win. I wanted to like this, but unfortunately because the game is played in a certain way, you end up hardly ever actually getting into RTS fights. Like, they're designed to last less than five minutes and you really need to build up your base in order to enjoy the effects of having a Marv you can just pull out of nowhere. Like, where's the point or the fun in that if they're just gonna run at you instead of digging in and building up and having a real fight? The Global Conquest mode just kind of feels like I'm clicking through a grand strategy game, except I don't have the added tactical layer of a grand strategy game, so I'm bored. What's really crazy though is even 10 years later, Command & Conquer 3 and Kane's Wrath had a pretty active competitive player base, and there were shoutcasters that were active as recently as last summer, July of 2017, was tournaments. Which, I'm really bummed that when I finally got around to doing all the research for this video, it looked like most of them were done. And that's a huge bummer because some of them were pretty good. I did some digging around and found out that Game Replays is still pretty active when it comes to Command & Conquer 3 and Kane's Wrath. And hopefully I'll have this video out in time to tell you about how there's going to be a Kane's Wrath Decade Cup on March 10th of 2018. I really hope this is out by then. And I really hope Spartacus comes back. Despite the high quality of Command & Conquer 3, it was around the time that EA came to its greedy corporate senses and realized that fun games are big money-making games, and two other promising projects got cancelled. The first of which was just called Tiberium. 
It was supposed to be a tactical type shooter taking place during the screen invasion of Command and Conquer 3, where you'd play a commando type very similar to Renegade, except now there's a lot more focus on Tiberium and summoning squads, and you had a transforming gun, along with squaddies you could summon to take certain tactical positions to aid your fight against the Skrin. And if you're wondering if this sounds alarmingly similar to a certain game, you are dead on right. Looking at the certain gameplay vertical slices that they released for Tiberium, it's really obvious this game is very heavily inspired by Star Wars Republic Commando. And while the game was repeatedly pushed back on its release date for quality concerns, it eventually cancelled because the suit said that it just didn't make it up to snuff for EA's strict quality standards. I have a feeling that plagiarism accusations were a serious concern, as while some games were very reminiscent of their predecessors that EA put out, this is like borderline skin swapping and modernizations. It's a shame though, maybe this could have been its own thing, but what happened happened. The other game that got cancelled was called Project Camacho, which supposedly was going to take place in the Command and Conquer Generals universe and be something of a Red Dawn analog, where you play people in an invaded USA and Supposedly, it was a hybrid shooter real-time strategy. Not much is really available about this game aside from some screenshots and concept art, so there isn't much to go on. I can say, however, that I know that hybrid RTS games do work, and if you want an example for yourself, the Spellforce series is a great place to start. My personal favorite being Spellforce 2. I'm not sure how a hybrid RTS shooter would really work in this case, and I'm pretty sure the devs didn't know either, because this thing got cancelled. What didn't get cancelled, though, was later in 2008, we got Command & Conquer Red Alert 3. This game immediately starts off with a familiar scene where, oh no, the Soviets are losing, but don't worry, Tim Curry's here and he'll fix everything. So, first thing we do, we go back in time, do something that radically alters the future, and now somehow Imperial Japan is a massive threat, even though they weren't around in the first two Red Alert games. Also, it would appear that any woman's lower body garment longer than mid-thigh length is illegal according to international law. I guess that's just how Red Alert 3 rolls. Who cares, we got a cool version of Hellmarch. And that's pretty much the theme of Command & Conquer Red Alert 3. Screw it, we're just getting even wackier than you thought we could. We're immediately just shooting attack bears out of cannons. The Japanese have giant samurai robots. The Americans have war dolphins. Everything is just thrown out the window to make an extreme, wacky, combined arm game. And unfortunately, it looks like that sort of took a front seat to more important matters. I can't help but notice the graphics look notably worse than Command & Conquer 3 Tiberium Wars, and the UI seems a little more clunky. Resource gathering has been pretty streamlined in favor of just more wacky stuff to do, and everything comes down to General's abilities and how you level up your Commando type. But hey, we've got Kirovs again, so it's all okay. Command & Conquer Red Alert 3 was followed up by an expansion called Uprising, which focuses on the events after the main story of Command & Conquer 3, plus the origin story of Emo Sailor Moon over here. You get a few new units and a few new modifiers, but other than that, not much going on. There was also the Commander's Challenge, which is a series of challenge maps where you have various restrictions set on your character, and it's under the guise of aliens trying to get human technology or something. I didn't get too into these. It turns out EA's practices were especially bad as far as RTS games go, with Greg Black saying in an interview that they were given 11 months to make an RTS game compared to Blizzard doing 3-6 to six years to make sure their games were alright. This caused their engine to never get the TLC that it needed and a lot of stuff in general just being really rough around the edges. You can see this a lot with Red Alert 3's menus and stuff. Command & Conquer certainly seemed like it was on a downward slope, and the next cancelled game turned into a rush product is the hallmark of that. In some time after Command & Conquer Red Alert Uprising, a game called Command & Conquer Arena was going to be made specifically for the Asian market, according to one of the former producers of this game. The embarrassing thing was this was obviously going to be an exploitative free-to-play game, and it just didn't look like it was going to be very good in the slightest. To accent just how much of a lazy, short-sighted cash grab this game was going to be, the concept art for this game in the UI overtly steals screenshots from the game's main rival StarCraft II's teaser trailer. 
I'm not joking, these were the official releases for Command & Conquer Arena. EA decided, in spite of all of this, they were going to release the game anyway. They're going to make it a canon continuation of the series with the story in single player mode, and it was going to be Command & Conquer 4, Tiberian Twilight. I don't know where to start on this dumpster fire, aside from what I previously told you about Command & Conquer Arena to give you the context. This game pretty much abandons all the tenants of all the previous games and has you use a unit supply cap system that's very restrictive and very obviously meant for a quick multiplayer game. The UI of this game makes it really feel like this was supposed to be some sort of tablet game ported over to PC at the last minute to try to cash in on Command & Conquer fanboys. And if you look at the units themselves, it looks like, yeah, this was a mobile game. Everything is very simplified using very basic colors, and there's not much actual animation going on. Things just kind of move around. It doesn't help that nearly all the units are experience locked and you'd have to grind a ridiculous amount just to get end game units. Oh, by the way, this is an always online game that you must sign into your EA account to access. Always online, all the time. We don't care about single player. And we don't care about the story because the story was utter crap. Apparently you were some guy that fought during the Skrin invasion and now you have special eyes got brought to you by Kane and we're getting rid of Tiberium. The rest is inconsequential, and it all ends with the Skrin Tower doing a thing, and you get shot, and please stop trying to make me care about this wife lady. I, I just stop. This is terrible. Why? Oh yeah, money. This game was near universally panned by critics and fans alike, and I don't know why anyone thought it was a good idea to make this project the final thing. And guess what? It was a mobile game because eventually they did port it over to mobile and it ran so much better. All the while this was going on, Blizzard was having a party with StarCraft 2. Like, I'm not kidding. The local Fry's Electronics where I live had developer meet and greets and a live band and a full on like block party to celebrate StarCraft 2. And when StarCraft 2 finally came out, it was no question which series was better. And if anything, it would be more fair to compare StarCraft 2 to Red Alert 3 or Kane's Wrath because Command & Conquer 4 is an embarrassment to the franchise. I'd say this was a catastrophic end to the Command & Conquer franchise, but believe it or not, this is not the end. In 2011, during the Spike TV Game Awards show, they announced that there'd be a new tentative titled Command & Conquer game that was going to be some sort of service where like it was a multiplayer RTS thing, but you could buy single player mission packs and it was supposed to be in generals, but it's the service was called Command & Conquer. They were really weird about this and they were promising a whole lot. The year after, in 2012, we get the final Command & Conquer game that came out. Command & Conquer Tiberium Alliances, a friggin' cow clicker, Clash of Clans style ripoff. This game is pretty much designed to milk you with long wait times and getting you to buy their stupid little credits. And everything is just so dull as dishwater. There's no strategic layer. You just throw your units at the enemy in waves and just pay more money if you want to get more stuff. This is the whimper that Command & Conquer ended on. And yeah, you can still play it today if you really wanted to, but trust me, you don't want to play this. I played this so you don't have to. The maybe, maybe not Command & Conquer's Generals 2 got canceled in 2013 after the studio making it folded, and this is what we're left with. They were even going to make a Red Alert reskin of this, but the backlash was so bad that that one got scrapped too. Command & Conquer was effectively dead. So who really killed Command & Conquer? Was it a greedy publisher pushing more and more on the studios that made it, eventually causing everything to buckle under its money-grubbing weight? Was it a rival franchise that just bested it at every turn? Was it perhaps the fact that half the devs left to make other games splintering the core team? In my opinion, it doesn't matter. Everyone seems to have gotten a happy ending out of this, or at least what they deserve. The people at Patroclyph are still putting out strong RTS titles with Grey Goo, the 8-Bit Armies franchise, and another game coming up called Forge Battalions, which looks pretty promising with its tech tree and unit control. 
EA Games is now largely recognized as a franchise-killing, studio-crushing evil. And even though right now all these uh, news stories are based off some rando on Twitter making the claim, they might even have to give up Star Wars for their transgressions, and we'll get that franchise back at least. Who knows? Maybe Disney will give the license back to Petroglyph, and we'll get an Empire at War too. Even the actors from those goofy FMV movies got a happy ending. Joe Kukan, the guy that played Kane, now owns a theater company in Las Vegas. And no, not one of those theater companies, like an actual, reputable, high art theater company. And as far as theater geese go, that's the dream right there, is owning your own thing and doing your own thing. And no one's there to stop you. Also, if you'd like some additional reading on all this stuff, he and his brother did an AMA on Reddit, which is possibly the best AMA I have ever read. It is just an absolute treat to go through. These guys get it, they did follow-ups, and it's all around a great laugh and very informative about the Command & Conquer series. And as for us, the fans of the franchise? Well, we still have the games. We can still play them, and they're great. There's tons of fan patches and conversion mods, update mods. Heck, for some reason somebody decided that they were going to put all of Command & Conquer 3 ported into Red Alert 2, just because they could. There's also fan makes of Renegade style games like Renegade X and Command & Conquer Reborn. Now, as far as the question, will we ever get an official Command & Conquer game ever again goes, I looked this up and according to the online search for the US Patent Trademark Office, EA filed their Section 8 and Section 15 affidavits for the Command & Conquer trademark in 2016, which means they don't even have to so much as affirm they are still using the thing until sometime between 2021 and 2022. Heck, if they really wanted to, they could argue that reselling the Command & Conquer franchise on Origin and also having various Command & Conquer games on offer on Steamworks counts as use of the property, so they don't have to make anything new. It really sucks, but at least they can't take away our memories and the games we had. Ah, oh boy, we're done. Thank you so much for sticking with me for this. There was so much to cover. I thought this was originally going to be a 20 minute video, but there were just so many other avenues to look down, especially with Petroglyph and all the canceled games that made this into a monster of a project. Feel free to join me on the Discord. Check out my Twitter for medium heat takes. And don't forget to subscribe. Also, Patreon helps. Please give me Patreon money. I like Patreon money. I like money. Thank you so much for joining me on this. And enjoy the kitty footage as I let the credits roll. Have a great day. See, isn't this much better? We can clean out all our stuff and you can be our little helper. What is this about? You want the, oh, you don't want the pets. Okay, fine. No, you don't get to go back in there. Critical unit lost. Battle control terminated.